Let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Magnus Hagender. Uh, I'm here to talk to you some about the Postgres replication protocol. Uh, I'm a Postgres consultant primarily. I'm from Stockholm in Sweden. Uh, work for a company named Red Pill Inpro. That's the little red pill in the corner, right? Uh, we do open source consultancy, and uh, my team focuses on database sites and obviously uh, on Postgres when it's databases, right? Uh, so I'm here to talk to you again about the Postgres replication protocol, uh, the tools and the opportunities around this and the things that have happened lately. So I notice a number of people in here who've actually been in previous versions of this talk. Uh, how many people know that they've been in previous versions of this talk? Really? I was going to give you the chance to, you know, sneak out silently in the beginning because uh, if you've seen a previous version, it's, that hasn't changed much. There are a few minor things, but in general, uh, the roadmap for what has happened has been fairly clear over the past couple of years. So the only major difference is that a number of things have moved from the area of being opportunities to now actually being tools, uh, which is the kind of direction that we'd like to see things move. So when we talk about the Postgres replication protocol, we talk about the new stuff that we added in Postgres 9, right? The streaming replication part. Uh, hot standby is obviously important, but streaming replication is the, the protocol level and the lower layer of how we transport and how we deal with the actual replication traffic between our primaries and our slaves. Uh, it's based on streaming the transaction log, or as we often call it in Postgres, the WAL, the write-ahead log. It's... Uh, Exactly the same thing with two names, kind of annoying sometimes, but uh, that's what we're talking about. We always start from what we call a base backup. That's the terminology we use for whatever. Some databases will call the same thing a full backup, for example. Uh, we call it a base backup. It's basically, well, it's where you start from. And then we use standard recovery code. Uh, the same one you'll use if you're restoring from backup. The same one you'll use if your system you know, crashes, obviously. Postgres doesn't crash, right? But this is the hardware you're running it on might crash, particularly if you're running it on virtual machines or cloudy or anything, strange things like that. Uh, and the Postgres replication protocol is layered on top of the standard Postgres protocol. So basically all of this replication stuff is layered on top of something else. We got the actual replication is layered on top of recovery and restore functionality. The protocol itself sits on top of the standard Postgres protocol which has given us a lot of flexibility and a lot of functionality completely for free. Uh, the, post, the current version of the Postgres protocol has been around for seven or eight years, I think, by now. It's not something we change often. Um, we're going to change it fairly soon to a new version, but the core of the protocol uh, is a very stable uh, thing to sit on top of and has a lot of functionality. So looking at the different parts of the puzzle that we're going to talk about through this talk, uh, the connection processing and startup, how that actually works in Postgres, for those of you who are not aware of that. The Postgres protocol itself, which is, again, the foundation uh, of how we do this. <clears throat> the replication-specific protocol that sits on top of this. And then sort of moving into the tool space, which is, uh, has been very much focused around the PG-based backup tool that was added in Postgres 9.1, uh, which was actually... When I started doing this talk the first time, that's the part that was entirely in the opportunities part, because we didn't have any of these tools. We just had the raw protocols in 9.0 that we kept on working on. So for a normal client connection, how does Postgres work? Uh, so what happens is it's a TCP connection. You can also have a local Unix domain connection in Postgres. Uh, we're going to ignore that. They, are, they work exactly the same uh, in replication scenarios you're probably going to have a TCP connection because replicating locally over this, to the same machine is, doesn't make much sense, does it? Other than possibly through testing. So we get a TCP connection. It, you get the kernel taking care of all the uh, TCP packets going back and forth, and we have a TCP connection running on port 5432. Now at this point, uh, what Postgres does is fork. What you'll see in a lot of other databases is you'll spawn a thread or you'll associate a worker thread somewhere with the existing connection. Uh, but, I mean, you've all used Postgres, you know, we use a multi-process model, so we create a completely new process that will take care of this specific connection. And once we've done this, we do a potential SSL negotiation. This happens immediately after the fork. <clears throat> and this is first the level where the, pro uh, the Postgres protocol itself negotiates SSL by, you know, checking does the client and the server both support SSL? What are the settings of the client parameter uh, SSL mode? And what does potentially the HBA file say 
about SSL. And once that's done, if we determine that SSL should be used on this connection, then we hand it over to the actual SSL protocol level negotiation uh, to set up encryption, verify certificates, and all of this. This is the first thing that happens as soon as we get in. Once we've done this, we get a number of parameters that are sent from the client to the server unconditionally at all times. We get the database name, and we get the username. These are what we're using to map to the row in pghba.conf to figure out how we're going to do authentication of this guy. And any, uh, a number of other options, such as client encoding, uh, these settings that we need to know for every connection are sent at this point. And once we've reached this, we have enough to find the row in pghba.conf so we can perform, uh, excuse me, perform authentication. However, that happens to be configured, whether it's username, password, we might do a Kerberos exchange to log you in. We might check an LDAP login. We might use SSL certificates to log in. That all happens during the early startup. And once we've performed authentication, assuming it's successful, right? If it's not successful, we just terminate the connection and kill the process completely. But assuming it's successful, uh, we select the database. Uh, that basically means Postgres will, well, it'll run a chdir into the data directory of that specific database, but will also preload the cache with a number of entries from the system tables that are specific to this database. And once we've done this, we are ready to start processing queries to start doing things. Uh, so we enter the query processing loop, where we just stay forever in this backend. We just run a query, we get a query, take a response, get a new query, send a response, and we keep doing that until we're done with the connection. Now this is a normal Postgres client. If we change this into what it looks like when we're talking about a replication client, it's very similar. Um, there's actually just a couple of things we change here. We do the database username option thing, we change a bit because there's no database name when we're cre creating a replication connection. Uh, in that it's actually a hard-coded uh, database name that we use. There's also no point in selecting a database if we don't have a database. And obviously, we're not going to enter a query processing loop because we're not going to process queries. But we are going to accept the TCP connection at exactly the same place. And we're going to fork. And we're going to do SSL negotiation the same way. And we're going to perform authentication the same way in exactly the same place in the code. It's the same line in the same C file. Uh, the big advantage of this is any way you can set up and use authentication for your regular Postgres clients, you can also use authentication for your replication clients. So if you've set up you know, Active Directory integration with Kerberos and GSS API and whatnot for your clients, you can use this for your replication as well. Uh, and I found this, uh, myself, I found this to be really, really useful in many deployments. Uh, so I'm happy to say that you know, I was initially against layering it this way on top of the authentication because I thought it would be too complex. Uh, it was definitely worth it. I withdraw that objection, or rather I did a while ago. Uh, it's uh, shown to be very useful. So the things that we change, again, uh, we change the database username options to just get the database. It's going to be replication. We still get the username. We still get the option. And then we start something called a while sender instead of entering the query loop. Now, we're still inside the same process. We don't start yet another process. It's just we call a function called while sender main uh, in the Postgres backend. So what is this while sender? It is basically it's a special purpose Postgres backend. Uh, <coughs> like um, a regular backend is always connected with a single database. This is why you can't change database or do cross database queries in Postgres. A backend is locked to a single database. The wild sender is not. It just exists. It only accepts very, very, very simple queries and commands. Uh, I think there are three commands in total that you can send to the wild sender. It's very, very simple. It will return. These, these are commands. Again, this is, we're running on top of the standard protocol, so these are regular commands. They look the same way. You can actually run these commands from PSQL if you're careful with exactly how you start it and you enjoy watching binary data on your screen. Uh, it returns a mix of result sets, which are formatted just like any other Postgres result set, and streams, 
which are formatted exactly like your copy strings. Uh, and if we're looking basically in Postgres 9.0, again, where this is the very simple case, uh, it only supports a single thing, which is the client connects. It tells the server, give me all the transaction logs starting at point X. The server goes into the mode where it starts sending the transaction log, and it never stops until the TCP connection goes away. There's no further commands. Once the client has said, give me all the data, that's where we are. It's just going to keep sending that. So uh, taking half a step back, we said this is all layered on top of the Postgres protocol. So let's talk about the Postgres protocol. It's very simple. We can talk about this fairly quickly. Um, it's nice when there's a simple protocol. Far too many protocols are way too complicated. So it's always going to be TCP. Well, it's always going to be a streaming socket. Again, we can have a Unix domain socket, but it works the same way. It is a message-based protocol. Uh, we generate fixed messages, pass them along. It's bidirectional. Uh, there is no special streaming protocol that it's only one way. The protocol is always two way. We can optionally SSL encrypt it. And when we do this, the entire TCP stream is wrapped in SSL. We don't try to sort of do encryption at the layer of an individual message or anything. We just use whatever SSL library we have. Currently, that's OpenSSL. It's the only one we support. Uh, the protocol doesn't restrict us to that, obviously. And we just wrap the whole stream in SSL in that case. And the message, as its simplest, is really, I mean, this is the simplest way you can do it. You have a message type that is one byte. There are some 30-ish or so, I think, message type defines in total in the protocol. You have a message length. That's a 32-bit integer. So a single message will never be greater than 2 to the power of 32. Um, usually, they'll be a lot smaller than that. And then you have the message itself, which is obviously the format of the message is depending on exactly what the message type is. So a standard query exchange between a client and a server just looks something like this. We have a message type called ready for query that's sent from the server to the client. Uh, that is the code Z or Z, depending on where you're from. Uh, we do try, you know, libpq and Postgres do understand both the differences between British and American English, so they're fine with that. <laughs> I'm not sure it understands Canadian, though. That might you might have some issues with, with if you're trying to connect. So, in French, you like. yeah, you can probably get, yeah, you can get error messages French. That's fine. Yeah, right. uh, and you get a size. And what we do these days, as of Postgres protocol version three, is along with this, we send the transaction status information which is just, are you currently in a transaction, and is this transaction you know, broken or not? Uh, the client will respond, or will, at the time it's time to run a query, it'll send a simple query message, which is the queue message. Uh, it has a length, which is going to be the length of the SQL query that we're running, uh, coming up there, and then we got the actual SQL query just straight in as a text string. It's sent to the parser, it's parsed, it's optimized, it's executed. We get some sort of a response. And the response to a standard query is going to start uh, with a row description message, which tells the client the format of this specific result set. Uh, the T message, it has a size, it lists the information about each individual column, like what data type is in this column, how big is the data type if it's a, a variable length data type, uh, sorry, fixed. And then we send one or more data row messages. If you get 100 rows, you get 100 data row messages. That's pretty simple. The D, it's got the size, it's got the values. Um, and when the whole query is done, we've returned all the rows, we return a command tag message that just tells you basically what did we just do. It's sort of the I'm done now message. So in this case, we'll send the command tag C and a select telling us exactly uh, that that's what we did. Now, if we apply this exchange to the streaming replication protocol, it looks uh, surprisingly similar. Or maybe not surprisingly, but it does look similar. We got the same ready for query message. It's being sent by this while sender protocol. This is why we can talk to it with something like uh, uh, PSQL. We can talk to it with anything that uses libpq. You can talk to it with the JDBC driver if you want to. I'm not sure it's a good idea, but you could. Uh, and we send. Again, a simple query message. This is the same message that we use to run a regular query. So we send the simple query message. If we want to start a replication, 
we send the start replication. Uh, the zero slash zero, that's the Postgres way of formatting the transaction log location. Zero slash zero means you just set the system up. That's the very first transaction point. Actually, I don't think we have zero slash zero anymore. I think that was changed, so it actually starts at one now, so that we can use zero to identify an error. Uh, I believe that was changed in 9.1, or maybe 9.0 even. I'm trying to look around at the people who could confirm this for me, but they're looking confused. I believe you're correct. Thank you. Uh, and for some reason, I wasn't looking at you. <laughs> but thanks for confirming anyway. I seem to recall hearing that discussion. Yeah, no, there's, there, were, there were some issues around where you, if, if your recovery actually crashed exactly at the segment boundary, it would come up thinking it was done. That was bad. <laughs> so the difference now is that instead of sending the uh, data header message, we're sending a copy out response. This is the same kind of response as if your query was actually a copy. Um, that's a W message. We've got a size and then we've got two flags sent to it. In streaming replication, they will be zero and zero. One of them tells you how big is each row, or uh, sorry, how many uh, columns are in each row. If you do a regular copy from a table with three columns, one of those will be a three. But we're not copying a regular table, so we're setting it to zero. The other one identifies that this is a binary copy. It's not a text mode copy. It's a binary mode copy because obviously our transaction log is a binary log. And then we send a copy data message, which is just a D, the size, and then some binary transaction log data. And after that, you know, we'll send another copy data message, and then we'll send another copy data message, and we'll just keep going. And we will never stop. Uh, the actual sizes of these xlog data messages will depend on how your data is being generated. But as soon as the data is written to the transaction log, it will be sent across the replication connection. And as we were in, in Postgres 9.0, this is really all there was to the replication protocol. That's all we had. Uh, and then in 9.1, we started building a little bit further on this, started adding some more functionality. Um, well, for one thing, we added synchronous replication, right? But I'm going to cheat and not actually talk about how that integrates in the protocol. But it's really, it's, it's a secondary set of messages just flowing from the uh, replication slave back to the master telling it how far along it is. We also added something called a hot standby feedback, uh, which is whereby the slave ships information about open transactions back to the master to avoid hot standby query conflicts. Uh, but that's also really more of a hot standby feature. On the lower layer, when we're talking about the, the replication protocol itself and the tool set, is we actually added something, we sort of a micro SQL, micro language used for the while sender, so that it can now accept a number of new commands. It can do more things than we could ever do before. Um, basically, we now have a, a full grammar running in while sender mode. Previously, the while sender command was, you know, if string compare input with start replication, do this. Else, error, I don't know what to do. Uh, we do have a full grammar. It has very few commands and it has a very few options, but it does exist there and it's being, uh, more is being added to as uh, requirements show up. It's still going to be extremely picky about how you do it. Okay, if you thought standards conforming strings made it hard to make, get things exactly right, this is a lot more picky than that. It's not intended for you know, manual consumption. It's intended for tools. It's intended for Tools like PG Base Backup, it's intended for the replication slaves uh, and nothing other than that. But it's sort of forming a foundation uh, for future improvements where we can build more tools using this uh, low level binary uh, access to the, the Postgres system. In the future, we might be able to use it to talk uh, about things that aren't necessarily transaction log. Uh, for those of you in here who were in Simon's uh, clustering uh, briefing, I guess we call the other night. That kind of stuff is probably, may well be layered on top of this. There's a lot of things we can do here uh, because we have a generic protocol. So these are the commands that we actually have available in Postgres 9.1. So it's still not all that much. We had an ident identify system in uh, Postgres 9.0. It's a very simple command. If you connect to run identify system, you get a single row back that tells you the system ID which is used to make sure you're replicating from the master that you're supposed to be replicating from, not just some random other Postgres database. 
Um, and that's pretty much it. There is a second column name. I can't, for all my life, remember what the second column is, so it clearly can't be important. Uh, we have the start replication command, which works exactly as before. You send start replication, you give it a position. I mean, if you want to try this, go into PSQL, connect to the database name <coughs> replication, type in start replication, zero slash zero, and you know, watch your transaction log come back and beep at your screen. Uh, it's interesting when you do that by mistake. Uh, the new command that we added in 9.1, the first of the new utility commands added to the, uh, this sort of micro language, is base backup. Uh, which takes a number of parameters and, well, it kind of tells you what it does, right? It will perform a base backup. Uh, that's the only new command so far in 9.1. We haven't actually added any new commands at all in 9.2 yet. We've added a new flag uh, to base backup, I believe, but not an actual new command. So what base backup does is it gives you a single command base backup. It's starting to look uh, like I was in, in a talk earlier today about the... Uh, wonders of SQL Server and how it's so much better than Postgres. Uh, and one of the things it had was, you know, you can connect and you can run backup over SQL. Well, guess what? We can do that too. You don't necessarily want to do it from your command line client, uh, but you run the base backup. So you no longer need to deal with this uh, manual, you know, connect to PSQL, run PG start backup. Take your backup, connect again, run PG stop backup. And then don't forget to you know, make sure that everything worked fine. And absolutely don't forget to actually run PG stop backup or your backups are useless. Uh, so we get it all completely integrated. You can still control things like the backup label if you actually care about the backup label. You can control checkpointing. You can control a lot of these things. Uh, now, it's not a silver bullet, so to speak. This is not what everybody wants to use for backups, but it's very simple. It's very easy to use, and it turns out to work pretty well. The old method is still there if you want to. Uh, but, I don't know, most people don't need and don't want it. The new method is more robust. Um, so along with this, uh, the, the protocol is still, you're not intended to use this for manual consumption, right? You can run this in PSQL, and you will get your base backup at, as a copy result right on your screen. Uh, which you probably don't want. So this is why we have the tool PG Base Backup that will let you do this. This is the tool that we added in Postgres 9.1. So it's not available in 9.0, it's in 9.1, it'll be in, in uh, future versions of course. And it's also designed to be used as an integration point for third-party backup systems. If you're using one of these super expensive enterprise backup systems, they can integrate with this. I don't actually know if anyone does that yet, so if anyone you know of one of the big backup systems that actually speak this new protocol, that would be interesting to know. So please let me know if you do. Uh, but it's there for them to use. So it's a fully documented protocol. It's an official protocol. It's not considered an internal protocol. It's just not for end user consumption. So the streaming, the actual backups that you end up receiving are simple TAR files. TAR is a very nice standardized format that hasn't changed since, I don't know, since they started building computers or something. Um, it's very easy to stream. Many other archive formats, like if you use a zip file or something like that, actually have a header in the beginning. TAR doesn't have a header. It's designed to be streamed because it's designed to run on tapes. And you really can't do seeking on tapes. You have to stream your data onto tapes. So no global archive header. Uh, all files in a TAR archive are aligned at 512 byte boundaries. Again, this is also a, a legacy from talking to tape drives. But it turns out all Postgres data files are already aligned on an 8 kilobyte byte boundary. So the only cases where you're losing, sort of wasting space by using this is for maybe your configuration file and your PG control, not, not even PG control, uh, but style your PID file. For the majority of your database, it's already aligned at these uh, 8 kilobytes, which is obviously also aligned at 512. So you don't actually lose anything. What you're going to receive is one TAR stream per table space. So if you have 10 table spaces, you will receive 10 TAR files, one for each table space. If you were in the default scenario where you have only one table space, well, you will receive only one TAR file. And they will all be transmitted sequentially. 
we don't currently have support for backing up multiple table spaces in parallel. We'll just do them one by one. Uh, so if we look at this again in the protocol, uh, it looks very much like the other stuff. We start with, with our ready for query message. Well, we send back the base backup label foo, saying this is the thing I want to do my base backup of. Um, what we end up getting here is first we get a regular libpq result set. So a regular result set with three columns, SPC, OID, SPC location, and size. That's the table space object ID, the table space location, the full path of where this data is supposed to go, and how big this table space is. By default, the size is going to be minus one, meaning it's not being used. Actually, no, it's going to be null. And then for each table space, we get a row with information about it. And when we get that, we get a command tag that says we're done with the select. Now, without waiting for any further data, we're going to send a copy out response. This is something that you'll, uh, it'll look like if you're sending multiple queries to Postgres with a semicolon between them. Then we just tack the uh, result sets on, on the end of each other. So you get a copy out response. Again, it looks exactly like the streaming replication, which is we send the, well, uh, number of columns zero, and yes, it's going to be binary, and then we just stream it to our data. Number of times when we're done, we send the copy done message, which is, which is the copy version of the command tag saying, okay, we're done with this file. And then we're going to send another copy out response for your next table space. And we just repeat this uh, until we've sent all the data that we need. Uh, and once we're done there, we go back into the loop and you can run further commands if you want to. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you use, uh, actually, if you use a tool like Wireshark, they know how to disassemble this protocol. I mean, it won't, they won't disassemble the contents of your copy data, but they will know that it's a copy data message. So you can definitely disassemble and see that this is actually what's happening. Uh, and it's, it's fairly simple. So that, that's the simple uh, way of how this is done. Uh, now, again, what we normally use for this is we use PG-based backup. If you're a DBA, if you're actually going to use this to take backups, you use the tool PG Base Backup that we ship as of 9.1. Um, it's a simple command line tool, like most of the ones we have. It takes a couple of options. Uh, it takes dash capital D to tell you which directory we're going to write the files in. Uh, it takes a dash capital F option, which works like, if, I mean, if you work with PG Dump, you'll recognize a number of these. The dash capital F is the format. It can be plain or it can be tar. Now, this doesn't actually change the format of how we're sending the data across the wire. We're always sending it in tar format. But if you choose format equals plain, PG base backup will unpack the tar file and regenerate the data directory. Whereas if you use format to tar, the T, it'll just drop a tar file, and then you can do whatever you want with this tar file. Uh, Dash C will control how we do the checkpoint, whether we do a fast checkpoint or a spread checkpoint. This is the same as the second parameter if you were using the PG start backup function. The first parameter is the backup label. The second parameter is a Boolean saying whether you want to do a fast checkpoint or a spread checkpoint. That's this parameter. Uh, we can set the label with dash L. We can enable compression with dash uh, capital Z. Um, if we do compression, it happens in PG-based backup. The data stream that's coming out of Postgres will never actually be compressed. But we can write compressed files. Same as if we're using compression in PG-dump, where the data flowing from Postgres to PG-dump will be uncompressed, and then we'll compress it and write it to disk. Now, on top of this, since we're running this thing over the standard libpq protocol, we accept all the standardly PQ client options, like the same ones you'll see in PG base back, uh, in PG dump, sorry, like dash capital U username, host name, port name, uh, port number, all of these things. If you're using Kerberos, it'll go talk to Kerberos. If you need a password, well, you have the same 
uh, kind of parameters you have for the other tools for always ask for password, never ask for password. Uh, and they, are, they look the same and they work exactly the same. Uh, we have another parameter that uh, solves the problem that a lot of people have been complaining about, uh, which is you can add dash capital P, then you will get a progress report. Uh, it will tell you how far ahead in your backup you are from you know, 0% to 100%. Ish. Um, it's fairly expensive because what it does is when you start the backup, it enumerates all the files in your data directory and, and, and sums up the size of them and sends that along to PGBase backup. And then it starts all over again by sending the files. So it'll be enumerating all the files twice. Now if you have a large number of databases or a very large number of objects in your database, this can be quite expensive because we're traversing a lot of files. If you have, don't have a large number of databases or a huge number of objects, you know, it's going to be in the cache anyway. In that case, it's not going to be that expensive to just figure out how big the files are. It's also going to be inexact, right? Because it gets the size of the files when you start the backups, but the files, your database is still online. It's still making changes while we're taking the backup, so the size of the file might well be different to the point that you know, somebody else might drop a huge table while you're doing the backup. Then the size estimate's going to be wrong. Or if someone else is loading a table, then the size estimate's going to be wrong. So actually, in the early versions, it didn't always end at 100%. Well, it now always ends at 100% because when it ends, we just adjust the value to 100% because we know we're done. Uh, but sometimes you can see it actually running up to 100% and then staying at 100% for a few minutes because the database increased in size as the backup was running. And we don't try to adapt to that in any way during the run. We just add up and when we get to 100%, we stop adding up. I wonder if we might actually stop it at 99. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. Um, but the point being, it's inexact, but it gives you a good hint. It gives you a hint whether you know, you're halfway there or you know, you've got time to go get a couple of more coffees. Um, now again, base backups combined with transaction logs uh, give us some other things. When you, whenever you restore from a base backup, you use... Um, or you require while archiving, transaction log archiving. Like many of you in here have set up you know, archive command and you know, remember to copy the files over there, make sure you check the exit codes and all of this stuff. It's kind of complex to set up. It can be complex to monitor. Now, PG Base Backup brings us one more feature that's very easy for the, the simple use case, which is if you add the dash X parameter to your PG Base Backup call, your base backup will include all transaction log that's required to restore this backup. So you don't actually need a log archive anymore for a physical backup. Now, if you do that, you don't get the ability to do point-in-time recovery. That will still require a log archive. But you'll be able to restore just this one backup. Because a base backup without any transaction log will, you know, Postgres will start up and say, sorry, can't do anything. Um, so what happens here is that the while sender will just include all the required while files at the end of the tar file. At the very end of the backup, it will just send the transaction log that's required. And this is basically all the transaction log that was generated between when you started the backup and when the backup's done. Uh, for those of you who've worked with the replication protocol, we have a parameter called while keep segments that you will need to use in this case that tells the server to keep enough while around. Because if you run this parameter and you have activity on your server, well, you all know we rotate the transaction logs at checkpoints. You get rid of them. And if Postgres deletes the transaction log before PG Base Backup has received it, well, PG Base Backup will say, you know, sorry, I spent five hours taking a backup, but eh, it didn't really work. Sorry. And it'll give you an error. It's not going to silently give you a backup that doesn't work. But it needs all those transaction log files. While keep segments lets you keep extra transaction log around to make this work. Uh, and that's the stuff that we have so far. That's the stuff we have in Postgres 9.1. And this is sort of where those of you who have seen this before, you know, now is when I switch to the opportunity side, but we've got 9.2 hitting beta now. So uh, a lot of these things are no longer on the opportunity side. They're now on please help with testing side. Um, 
first of all, we have a tool now that lets us do streaming log archiving. So uh, just show of hands, how many people in here have set up log archiving using archive command on Postgres? Uh, fair number of you. How many of you have not set archive timeout by mistake? <laughs> yeah. So the way that it works in Postgres previously is when you set an archive command, Postgres will run this command per, once per 16 megabyte of transaction log. It will then copy this transaction log to the archive. This is perfectly fine if you have a high velocity database. If you have a low velocity database, that might you know, take a day or two to generate 16 megabytes of transaction log. More commonly, maybe not a day, but maybe an hour. That means that this is your recovery granularity. You want to do point in time recovery? You generate 16 megabytes every two days? Well, you know, your granularity is two days. It's not very good. So we have a workaround for that, which is a parameter called archive timeout, which says ship these files maybe every 10 minutes, even if we didn't generate 16 megabytes of transaction log, which would be perfect if it wasn't for the fact that we still shipped 16 megabytes, even if we only filled it with 100 bytes. So you couldn't really, I mean, you'd like to set this archive timeout to five seconds and get a great granularity, but you'd fill your log archive with terabytes of data pretty quickly, because we'd send 16 megabytes every five seconds, which might be too much. Uh, now what really is, is that the Postgres replication protocol, if you have a replication slave, it already does this. The replication protocol already sends uh, the exact same data that would go in your log archive. So for this, we have a new tool in Postgres 9.2 called PG Receive Xlog that you run somewhere that's not on your database server. It will connect to your server as a replication client, and it will reconstruct the log archive for you just as if you were running archive command, except it'll receive byte by byte, not 16 megabyte by 16 megabyte. Um, it's basically, it's a Postgres replication client without Postgres. We sort of took out that big bloated thing and just ran a, a simple thing. It takes the replication stream, writes it directly to files. That gets you out of the trouble or out of having to choose between recovery granularity and filling up your drives with uh, with empty segments. Now, if you actually have a replication client already, this doesn't really help you because you can use the replication client to get to these, the last 15.4 you know, megabytes that never hit the log archive. But if you don't have a replication client, then this is used so you can get rid of this granularity problem. Uh, and based on the same thing, uh, we have a new parameter for PG base backup that basically take this same process that PG receive xlog does and runs it in parallel during base backup. So when you run uh, your PG base backup in this mode where you take the base backup and you want to include all the required transaction log, it'll just fire up a second connection that streams the transaction log while it's running the backup. Uh, so you no longer need to set while keep segments on the master. You no longer need to keep the while around on the master because we're receiving the while on the, on the backup node while we're receiving the base backup in parallel. Uh, and it's very simple. You just add the dash dash x log equals stream instead of just dash x, which is also, I believe, dash dash x log equals copy is the same one as the old method. Uh, and it'll just work. The main difference being is you now need two uh, replication connections to your master because we're running these over separate connections. We don't try to mix the stream somehow over the same connection. Another thing uh, that we've been working on that uh, I found fairly useful for the base backups in uh, 9.2 is relocatable table spaces. When you were taking base backups in Postgres, you know, between version 8.0 and 9.1, uh, there is a very annoying thing, which is you can move the data directory. It's fully supported to move your data directory. So you restore it into a different location. But if you have any non-standard table spaces, they must be restored into the same place. It's not supported to move your table spaces to new location. It's not supported. It works, but it's not supported. Uh, it kind of works. 
the thing is that the implementation prior to Postgres 9.1 uh, sorry, prior to Postgres 9.2, in 9.1 and earlier, is there is a system table called PG Tablespace, which has a column called SPC Location. It has an OID, an object ID, like every Postgres object, and an SPC Location that tells you this table space lives over here. And as we're restoring, we can't modify this because it's part of, of its system table. So we have to restore first and then change it, meaning that we need to restore the data into the right location first. Now, when you create a table space, we also put a symlink in the pg underscore tblspc directory in the data directory that points to wherever this thing is. And the fact is, even if you look into earlier versions of Postgres uh, prior to 9.2, the SPC location field in pg table space is never used. Not once. It's set when you create the table space, it's never used. It's only the symlinks that's used. It is only used by tools who need to find out where the table space lives. Uh, but it's not used when we actually access the tables. They only use this symlink. So what we did in uh, 9.2 is we just uh, deleted the SPC location field. It's no longer in PG table space. Instead, we have a function called PG get table space location. That'll return this by looking at the symlink. That means that as of 9.2, it's fully supported to move a table space and restore it into a different location than it was before Yay. by just changing the symlink, uh, which is quite useful. Now, as of uh, in, in 9.2, uh, it's still going to be a manual move, right? You restore the table spaces, you manually modify the symlink. Uh, we'll leave that as part of the whole, here's our still in the opportunity space. Uh, for 9.3 is to just add parameters like PG base backup or, or have a restore tool do this for you. But it's no longer stored in the database, so we can actually access and modify it before we start the restore database. Uh, I have one other thing that's sitting on my list on the opportunities part uh, that used to be a very long list. We've worked on this pretty hard, which is some sort of ability to do incremental backups. I don't think anyone has actually figured out the best way of doing this. One way of doing it uh, a lot of people who do incremental backups when you use PG start backup and PG stop backup is to use rsync. So we could build something rsync like into the uh, Postgres protocol. Question is whether it's going to actually be a win. Depends on what problem you're really trying to solve. Uh, I found myself um, when running this on, on production systems such that actually doing this with rsync can be pretty darn destructive for performance on the server while you're taking the backup. Because rsync generates a lot of random I.O. PG base backup generates nice sequential I.O., which is a lot faster and a lot lower load. So there are things to be done. There. There's also discussions, what can we do using the LSN? We have an uh, LSN on every page of every, data, uh, of every data file telling us which is the latest transaction that touched this page. Maybe we can use that to generate our own way of doing incremental backups. There are some issues around that as well. It's not quite as straightforward as it might sound, but there's, things could be done around that. Um, found a nice way to be able to decrease the size of a log archive uh, uh, without taking more full backups. Like being a, right now, you can decrease. I mean, you have to keep every log file from your base backup and forward. So the only way to keep your log archive small is to take base backups very often but the base backups are very big. So we need to find a way to consolidate these things together uh, to optimize that. Uh, now, I think we've done a pretty good job because, again, about a third of this talk used to be opportunities about a year ago. So a lot has happened in, in, in Postgres 9.1 and some more now in Postgres 9.2. I'm sure there's a lot more that we can build on top of this, both from the concept of base backup and within replication, obviously. Uh, but what we have now is a very solid foundation that we can build on. Uh, and that's really, I mean, that's the way we usually end up doing these things in Postgres, like put in a solid foundation, let somebody else figure out how to use it. Uh, so we're looking forward to more tools in this space and uh, more enhancements of these tools, obviously. Um, if you have any good ideas on enhancements that you'd like to do yourself or, you know, that you'd like to just flag for people that this would be good to use, we're very interested in hearing about that. Uh, and I think I actually have... Well, I do still have about one minute for questions. So, uh, any questions? Documentation? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep, sure. Well, you go first. Because <laughs> you actually put up your hand. So, I, I didn't understand one part of the use case, which was with dash x, because it's talking about what you currently yeah. have. Um, how 
do you use that in combination with any of the synchronization mechanisms? Like, assuming the idea is you take a base backup along with the walls no. that, are, that are happening while the base backup is being taken, and that gets you to a state where you're the same at that moment in time. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, what the dash X is for is if you run dash X and in plain text mode, or in not plain text, but plain mode, it will recreate the data directory. It'll put in the PGX log, and you can actually just do a PGCTL start right in that directory, and you're up and running. That's the use case for dash X. You don't need to set up the log archive. You don't need a recovery.conf or anything to get back up and running. It's a one-off backup that includes everything. Okay. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily use this then to create a second instance of the database that you then want to configure Sloney or whichever replication system with? Uh, Sloney no, Slo will get your logical replication system, so that's not going to work across. Now, you use PG Base Backup to set up a replication, a streaming replication slave, but then you don't use the dash X mode, because dash X is for one-off backups. Um, this should all be, actually it might not, the, the table space moving part might not be in the documentation. Everything else should be fully documented. Uh, well, uh, obviously other than the, the thoughts about incremental backups and such that don't actually exist. Comments about hooking up PSQL. Yep. Uh, what do you mean? Oh, oh, you can connect PSQL to, uh, I don't think there is a specific mention that you can do it with PSQL. Uh, but it's fully documented that it's a standard leap PQ connection. No, no, I'm, I'm just so, looking at ways to play with the system. Yeah. No, so there, it should, all the information should be there. Some of it is under, is actually in the protocol documentation and not in the end user documentation. But it's, it's all fully documented, except I actually think you may have a point in that we never actually updated the documentation about table spaces. Uh, you will be able to run PG Base backup against standby in uh, in 9.2. Yes, and Josh is looking at me back there and say, "I found bugs in this yesterday." So, but that's the beta version, right? <laughs> uh, there, there are a couple of I think there are two open bugs on the specifics of running the base backup on the slave right now, but it will be they will be fixed uh, before 9.2 is up. In 9.1, you can't run it on a slave; it can only be run on the master in 9.1. Oh, there was the, the waiting for the checkpoint happening on the master thingy. Oh, right, yeah. It's in that one. You found it. Somebody else found it before you, but... Yep? I believe there's a project called PGR Man uh, that has been doing that. Uh, I have never used the incremental backup there myself. I've heard someone who used it at an early point in time, and it looked like it worked and everything was corrupt. Uh, but I think they fixed that problem. Uh, but uh, yeah, looking to how PGRman does that is obviously a good step forward in figuring it out. I don't know of anyone other than PGRman who's done it. Are, are there any? Yeah. <laughs> that that would be the main issue. Yes. Uh, But I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, but I mean, yeah. From from the core side of perspective, we have this protocol now. We have the core part of it. We're hoping to see maybe get some more of Rman into core and get Rman to use these features instead of because some of the things that PGRman has been doing have been sort of hacky because that's the only thing, well, only way we could do it earlier. Uh, it's what everybody's been doing earlier. Is sort of hack around the limitations. We're trying to t get away the limitations and then we'll get away the hacks as well. Uh, so that's the. Whole. So I think uh, we are pretty much done. I may be running over. I don't have a schedule right now. Uh, but uh, this will be the last round of talks. So then after this, we have the closing session, which is right back where we all started with the opening session and the keynote. And I don't think there's an actual break. So I think Dan would appreciate it if once you're done here, just sort of head straight over there and uh, get ready for the closing session. So thank you all for showing.